Blog Talk Radio. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Franchise Interviews, where we're asking the franchisepreneur who owns one. I'm your host, Marty McDermott, with my co-host, Don Johnson. And if you've ever dreamed of owning your own business, then you've come to the right place. We have a great show this morning. We're meeting with Steve Spiegelman, who is an expert in the franchising industry with over 20-plus years' experience. And Steve is a frequent guest speaker with the IFA and has written numerous and fantastic articles on franchising in Franchise World magazine and has been interviewed in national publications such as Franchise Times, National Restaurant News, and was a quoted expert in a recent book, So You Want to Franchise Your Business. And that's coming up in segment two of Franchise Interviews. Stick around because we've got a great show. Franchise Interviews. For over two years now, Franchise Interviews has been giving you an up-close, behind-the-scenes look at franchising and entrepreneurship. Through our website, FranchiseInterviews.com, where you can hear and read interviews as well as get tips from some of the most successful sources in franchising. And our weekly franchise radio show, where each week you get to hear a new interview with franchisors, franchisees, franchise authors, experts, and attorneys. And our free franchise newsletter, which is a must-read for anyone looking to buy a franchise. And don't forget to listen to our podcast, Great Quotes in Franchising. For more information, go to FranchiseInterviews.com or call us at 610-905-2919. That's 610-905-2919. Need a business loan? Talk to Diamond Financial Services, the experts in franchise financing nationwide. Whether you're looking to start a franchise, acquire an existing franchise, or expand your territory through opening new locations, Diamond Financial stands by your side start to finish. From pre-qualification to packaging and presenting your application to securing a financial commitment and through the loan closing process, Diamond Financial is there. While you're waiting, thousands of others are making their financial dreams come true. Don't wait any longer. Pre-qualify now by completing a confidential, no-obligation financial analysis. Let's face it, traditional banks just aren't in the business of financing small business. At Diamond Financial, we specialize in securing franchise loans from $100,000 to $3 million and equipment leasing up to $150,000. Let us help you get started. Go to www.FranchiseFunding.net or call 877-508-2274. That's FranchiseFunding.net, back to Franchise Interviews, where we're asking the franchise to who owns one. I'm your host, Marty McDermott, with my co-host, Don Johnson. And if you've ever dreamed of owning your own business, you've come to the right place. How are you doing today, Don? Welcome back. Yeah, same to you, Marty. Doing fine. How are you? Good, good. Busy good. week last week. Uh, I was mentioning it to you earlier. I was in uh, Jersey City over the weekend doing a, another presentation of the Franchise Alternative, and that, that went well. It was another like, encore edition. Right. That presentation, you know, so it's, it's always interesting meeting with uh, aspiring entrepreneurs looking to buy a franchise. Right, right. The younger crowd seeing what their viewpoint is and I think overall younger people are looking to start up a business. Yeah, there's a lot more out there today, aren't there? Right. You know, I don't think there's, you know, one of the issues that came up, Don, was, you know, job security. You know, and, and in fact, you know, there were some older folks in the audience, um, you know, they, they spoke about, you know, there's not much job security out there today when you go to work for corporate America, you know, and I guess, you know, we're seeing that right now, you know, with you know, right. the economy and things like that. But, yeah, you know, I think a lot more people are, are, are more secure going into their own business, which is kind of different from, let's say, your parents' generation, you know. Right. Uh, kind of like a different business philosophy. So, 
Yeah, so it was, a, it was an interesting week last weekend. I know you were younger in people, uh, Marty, just see a lot of inconsistency and people getting mm-hmm. laid off and the economy's rough and it's hearing a of time. yeah bad stories of people uh, who've put in years at a particular business and are let go. Uh, just you know, rough thing. So no, that's maybe giving the younger entrepreneur more serious thought to opening their own business. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. I know you were in San Diego. I don't know if we we spoke about it a couple weeks ago. Yeah, it's one of the big uh, franchise shows, the IFA show, and it was interesting. Uh, we were you weren't at the beach, at... right? It sounds like you really were working <laughs> when you were there. Yeah, oh, I it's know. a beautiful city, though. It's uh, we oh, yeah. hotel I was at had a beautiful look at uh, the San Diego Bay, right there. Uh, oh, did it really? The eighth floor it was a real and a real nice uh, city. Yeah. What are we doing here in the Northeast? Why don't we? Our office should be in San Diego, shouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> I just have too much family here. In fact, can yeah, never move. That's what it is. I know. It's it's. But I hear San Diego is such a beautiful place. You know. In fact, our, our old studio used to be in San Diego. So, uh, yeah. No, absolutely. So someday we'll we'll we'll, we'll do a, a live show out there. I think. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Our last show down, we met with Sean Fitzgerald of the Wireless Zone Franchise Opportunity, and they were founded in 1988 as the Car Phone Store. And Wireless Zone has become the nation's largest independent wireless retail franchiser. And they were ranked number one uh, franchise in this category by Entrepreneur Magazine. So that's a pretty big milestone. Every one of their stores is independently owned and operated, uh, exclusively offering Verizon wireless products and services that certainly help them have a um, competitive advantage. I thought it was a very interesting show. What were your thoughts on last week? I learned a few things. Just the you know the rapidness of technology is really incredible. How um, and you know we all knew. Uh, and one good thing about their industry, I mean, everyone really has to have a phone. It's really a necessity these days. And that's for sure. And the repeat sale aspect was pretty interesting. I guess I mean a lot of people get a new phone every year, year and a half. It's been the case with myself. I didn't realize that that you know people do get a new phone. You know, it's, I think. Sean mentioned it was like every 18 months, and you know that's because you, you know one of the things I love about that industry as well, Don, is that technology is is changing so rapidly. You know, I mean, it seems like something new is coming out like every six months. You know, so right. it's really difficult to, to to keep up with everything. And as you mentioned, I mean, it really is a necessity today. I mean, you leave home without that cell phone, and you you feel lost. Right. You know, so it just really has become. Um, such an important part of our lives, you know. And everybody has a cell phone today. You know, it's not just, um, you know, it's not just adults, 18 to, right. you know, 60 years old. I mean, it's really for anybody and everybody. I suspect your kids. I mean, when they're only five years old now, I think they're going to be hitting you pretty soon for, yeah, the cell phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they're going to be calling you, you know, from school. And, I guess you know, they'll be five soon. When, 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 when will they start asking us? At seven or eight? I don't know. Well, Sean was mentioning his daughter. Uh, just recently asked for a cell phone. She's seven years old, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, and, and there's a lot of interesting technology that comes with it. You know, there's tracking devices so you can tell where your kids are at all times. Right. And, you know, this is part of the education process. I mean, you know, when when you own this type of franchise, you know, you're really more of a consultant right. to your customers because it has all these bells and whistles. You really have to show people how to use it, and not even how to use it, you know, what cell phone is, is is best for them, because what's best for you, Don, may not be what's best for me, you know, or your dad, you know, who, who probably doesn't, you know, he's probably not very big on technology, you know, gets like 100 emails every day, so he may not need one of those cell phones where you're constantly emailing. Right. You know, so, yeah. Good point. Just for like emergency to have it, or if you have to to, to, to make a call at, at any time. It's just great to have it. It helps me so much in my business where I'm helping people with financing nationwide. Mm-hmm. I mean, I couldn't imagine if, you know, we didn't have, if the people didn't have a you know, cell phone on them for me to reach people a lot of times. Yeah, it's so true. You know, I, I don't know, I, I hate to use the word recession-proof, but, you know, I, I think Sean might have mentioned using the word recession-resistant, you know, I, 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 right. and I would kind of agree with that. You know, I think it is one of those industries that probably is, not so much impacted. I mean, I'm, I think all industries have been impacted to, to some degree. But uh, again, when when you're dealing with uh, necessity items, um, you know, I, I I think it's a safe industry to be in. You know, so right. it would make me um, very very comfortable. He also mentioned it's a great time for leasing, isn't it? You know, I know one of your obstacles. You and I know each other such a long time now. You know, when franchising um, or the economy was just just really hot. Um, it was tough to get leasing space, wasn't it? Right. You know, when someone bought a franchise, I mean, um, it was very difficult to get a good location. And I think it's a little easier today 
than it was going back, you know, three, four, five years ago. You know, I think one of the articles we're going to talk about today talks a little bit about that. But yeah, it's a great position, buyer's market for people leasing space. It's completely switched from a few years ago. That is so true. He had a great quote. I don't know if you picked it up. I, I think you know this. This one is definitely going to make our great quotes in franchising um, podcast. He said uh, one of the things you get when you buy a franchise is the company's best practices. You know, and I said, wow, that's you know, that's never been said on the show. I mean, it's it's and it's so true. You know, I mean. This company has been around a long time. You know, they know what works. Um, they have a, a set of best practices that they follow, and uh, they know what doesn't work. And that is really what you're buying. It, it could be any franchise, right? I mean, it could be Jersey Mike's or right. you name it. Um, yeah. You know, but that is one of the things that you're buying is is, is best pra- practices. And you know, it's interesting doing my presentation last week. Um, you know, I just get so much information from the show. One of the uh, quotes that, that the audience really loved was um, when I was talking about the importance of dating a little, you know, and uh, that yeah. you really need to date the franchisor, and the franchisor really needs to date the franchisee. It's a good you way know, of putting it, yeah. It sure is, you know, and I just said, wow, that's, that's a great analogy. It really hit home with the audience, you know. So it's just such a learning experience as just doing the show, you know. I think you and I a lot of times think we know you know everything, and we certainly don't. You know, right. learn something every single show. So exactly, yeah, yeah. It's 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 just been incredible. You know, so um, so I know we got a great show today, don't we? Yeah, Steve Beagleman. Excited about having him on. Really good guy. I've met him a few times. Uh, you mentioned a little bit of his resume before. He's been in franchising twenty years. So we'll we'll learn a few more things from Steve today. Steve was funny. He was joking around too. He said he's been in franchising twenty years, and he's only twenty five years old. <laughs> <laughs> He's got, he's got a sense of humor, you know. So he's, he's, but yeah, his, his, his bio is just incredible. I mean, I was looking at it, I said, my God, you know, I said, you know, he really is a veteran in that. I, I recall reading some of Steve's articles, um, you know, in, in a lot of these trade magazines that you and I are constantly referencing, you know, uh, right. Franchise World Magazine or Franchise Times Magazine. So, uh, yeah, I was very familiar with his name, you know, so I was excited to have him as a guest today. And I know you have some interesting... Uh, Articles, don't you? From, uh, yeah, first uh, mentioned Marty a couple shows. Uh, the big international franchise expo is coming up. In Washington. Yeah, March 20 to the 22nd, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. People can go to the website ifeinfo.com. Now I'm going to make sure I'm there this We've year. been exhibiting there for years. So. Yeah, I know you guys are always there. I'm going to be there this year. You know, I know I didn't make it last year with the baby. I was a little disappointed right. about that. You know. He, Got his first big major cold last year, you know, so uh, I couldn't make it down to D.C., but I will actually be there this year, and uh, uh, my dad, Martin Sr., is actually coming along, too, so. Good, yeah. Be fun. We'll take lots of pictures. Excited about that, and the Franchise and Business Opportunities Expo has a couple shows, San Jose, March 7th and 8th, uh, and then Denver, Colorado is having a show April 4th and 5th. Seems like there's a lot of these more um, smaller, intimate shows today too, Don. Don't you think? Um, right. Well, they put on a lot of these smaller shows around the country. I think they do between 10 and 15. But information on those shows, U.S. Franchise Expos. That's with an S. dot com to find out more about the San Jose and Denver shows coming up over the next uh, month and a half. Okay, good. I forgot to mention too. Um, we're, we're having a celebrity on next week. Um, Dr. Shane, who we've had on in the past, he uh, recently wrote uh, another book called Fool's Gold, uh, The Truth Behind Angel Investing in America. And I'm excited about that because it's kind of a different show. You know, I mean, again, it, it's, it's always 95% franchising oriented. But here's just uh, something from the book. It says, the stereotype of the angel investor is a retired wealthy entrepreneur who seeks potential, uh, asks tough, quote, tough questions, uh, takes a large stake, and in a few years makes a massive return in an IPO. This outsider fills a gap between the venture capitalist and the professional investor, swooping in with cash and expertise to bring dreams of fruition. Unfortunately, Scott Chain observes this figure bears no relationship to reality. You know, he's he's, he's very big on, on on giving the truth, you know. Right. Um, you know, not painting that rosy picture which you know, you really need both sides of of the story. So, uh right. yeah, so looking forward to having him on the show. Yeah, had him on in the oh. past. Good. I'm excited to hear about his book. Here's something, Marty, by Laura Rains in the journal Constitution, January 25th. Small business hopes flourish. Uh, it starts out, the economic headlines are all doom and gloom. Bank failures, store closings, bankruptcies, unemployment. Would anyone even think about starting a business today? 
that's a good, good way, way to start, start out. Article. Article. <laughs> an article. It's pretty powerful, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, and, and some people should, says Lydia Jones, director of the Kennesaw State University Small Business Development Center. We're seeing markets and industries contract. Many small businesses are hurting. Uh, those that aren't strong enough won't survive. Others will make it uh, but won't grow. In times when the economy is booming or tanking, we are covered up with people seeking our advice and assistance, she says. Uh, despite the negative news, Jones is a firm believer in small business. I've seen small businesses turn on a dime when big business – couldn't or wouldn't change. Small business owners are so open to new ideas and ways of doing things, they're like sponges, and we need them right now. Uh, For all the tight belting and uh, small business pain, she's also seeing owners innovating and grabbing for opportunity amid the chaos. People start businesses in all economies, she says. She's seeing new enterprises succeed in the biotech, green energy, saving, training, and service sector. So when she sees someone come in with Blinders on, meaning that the person has such passion for his business idea that he's willing to take huge risk. She encourages him to go forward with caution. She, she advises entrepreneurs to plan more thoroughly than ever before because there are more challenges facing them in this economy. They can't leave any question unanswered when lending communities are still so cautious and customers less willing to spend money. You have to have a very strong package to present to lenders or investors. You need more contingency plans than usual. Uh, it goes on here. Um, it says, in a recession, entrepreneurs face more challenges and have less room for error. They have to be more creative about financing. Mm. Uh, venture capitalists uh, are still lending, but they're doing a lot, uh, being a lot more careful. Uh, right. In 2000 and 2001, the article gets uh, a little more interesting. It says, we had a recession, and then 9-11 happened, and things got bad, says Jim Rawbolt, a consultant with Axiom Franchise Advisors, who has owned franchises in the telecom, automotive, and medical sectors. The next five years, franchising grew by 18%. Buying a franchise makes sense for a vertical worker in a declining industry or an older worker who has been laid off. Uh, You can spend a year trying to replace a high-paying job you lost, or you could buy a franchise and start creating a revenue stream. Franchises offer people an opportunity to run their own business with backup. New business owners often wonder where to turn for direction and guidance. Those systems are built into the franchise, he says. Now is a good time to buy because franchising companies are bending over backward to cut fees, and as the economy rebounds, so will business. Now is a good time to get in. Uh, He advises people to do as much due diligence as possible, something you and I obviously are always uh, recommending, including visiting and talking with existing franchise holders or volunteering with a similar company. Uh, Funding will be difficult. Um, There are legal ways to tap into retirement plans for franchising. We're very familiar with that says Atlanta is a remarkable market. I think that's one of the top uh, cities in the country for, for franchising or where franchisors are based out of even. Huh. More franchising companies are headquartered here than any other city. It is a phenomenal city with supporting entrepreneurs. There's great opportunities for networking at all levels. Um, for many people, this can be the best time to start a business, especially if they can do it with the lowest overhead possible. It takes a while to get off the ground anyway, so why not start now? So it's pretty interesting how in a you know rough economy, I mean, a lot of times there can be opportunities there. Just not the start of business, but like this article says, you know, uh, smaller businesses tend to be more willing to change and adapt, and maybe even risk a little bit more or, or diversify. Right. Yeah, uh, you know, and uh, you know, I think one of the advantages too, you know, I mean, because this is general, you know, talking about all different types of businesses, you know, from uh, franchise to business opportunity. You know, and, and and one of the things I was also saying over the weekend, Don, is you know, with franchising, I think you don't have to uh, you don't have to think as much. You know what I mean? Again, go back to uh, something that Sean said last week. You know, was following the franchise's best practices. I mean, it's not really the franchisee's job, you know, to think outside the box. You know, I mean, it, it, it's good to look for opportunities, and, and again, some great ideas have come from franchisees. But again, always go back to the very basics of trusting you know, the franchise system, you know, and uh, right. you mentioned some interesting things about, you know, the whole packaging thing, how it's so important, you know. I mean, have you guys done anything or, and differently, you know, in the financing community or are you still pretty much following the same um, format? Because I know you guys do a great job as far as packaging, right? Um, like franchise loans and things like that. Um, but do you have to do anything different today or, I mean, is the packaging? Well, uh well, when, once we have a loan package together, uh, right. sometimes we're letting a, a couple different lenders know 
uh, like maybe uh, having them you know, even review it. Have we, right. we, we always send it out to one main lender, but maybe we'll mm-hmm. have a second lender kind of be on standby review and see if they might right. have an interest in case there's right. a problem with the first loan. Right, right. Uh, we're uh, just being more flexible that if someone can't get an SBA loan, that maybe they can piece together using their, their cash or maybe you know, using some of their home equity or rolling over some retirement or maybe getting an mm-hmm. equipment lease. Right. Trying to be a little more creative and getting people uh, you know, financing if they can't get or be pre-qualified for a business loan or SBA loan. Yeah, no, it's true. And I think, you know, people are, you know, I think the one thing that's come out of this is people are working harder, as you say, and, you know, uh, thinking more outside the box and coming up with some, we, we've seen some very clever ideas, haven't we, with franchising and the, and the whole community, right. you know, as far as, uh, you know, some of them are um, uh, reducing um, their uh what is it? Their startup cost or right. their startup cost, but they're discounting the fee. Uh, Some of them are even waiving them. I think. I, I think we've gone as far as seeing that as well. You know, so some are co co branding. Some co-branding. are going out and visiting the franchisees more. Weren't, weren't some of the guys at Cold Stone Creamery going around the country visiting every franchisee? They were going on tour. You know, I mean, imagine yeah. that in a bus. You know, I mean, and just going from you know franchisee to franchisee. You know, and I think that sends right. a very strong message. Yeah, you know, we should have yeah. monitored. We we, we should have. You know, taking all their weights before they started that tour, and then weigh them afterwards with all that ice cream. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. They come back to their loved ones all like 20 pounds heavier, you know. Yeah, their franchisees <laughs> will be in better shape, but they might have to see the doctor. <laughs> Oh uh, jeez, but no, it's, it, it is it is a great article. Was that from Was that from the Wall Street Journal? Is that where that was from, or? Uh, what about Cold Stone? No, no, the particular article you just read. That oh came. no, no, this was uh, from the Journal Constitution. Okay. Wherever the heck that is. <laughs> Washington D.C. I guess I don't know. Uh, here's something else, Marty. Franchising the road ahead. I'll try to get through through this pretty quick. I know Steve wants okay. to come on. Uh, innovative concepts can profit from recession. This was in the Wall Street Journal. This is by Julie Bennett, who, who we're familiar with. Oh, good. Uh, last month, almost 200 franchise company staff booths at the MFV Exposition Franchise Franchise Expo South uh, in Miami Beach Convention Center pitched their concepts to 8,600 visitors. Despite the global economic maelstrom and the recent uh, release of a gloomy report by the uh, IFA, the Washington-based trade group, the mood inside the convention center was optimistic. Uh, according to the franchise business economic outlook prepared by Price Waterhouse uh, for the IFA's uh, educational foundation, after decades of growth, last year's 864 U.S. franchise establishments, they're saying that they're going to drop slightly this year. Um, so maybe not have quite the growth understandable in this uh, economy. Right. Uh, they mentioned even some some franchise workers will lose their jobs. Meanwhile, the credit crunch means that potential franchisees can't get financing and established franchisees can't borrow the money to expand. We just talked about that a little bit. Um, and rising unemployment means that people who hired franchise services to mow their lawn or clean their houses will now be doing some of those tasks themselves. Mm, Personally speaking, I'm not going to be cutting my lawn. I'm not going to be cleaning my house. Oh, you're not? I hope my wife's not listening. <laughs> the International Council of Shopping Centers predicts that about 150,000 stores will close in 09. It's pretty incredible, but still kind of a small figure overall. Mm-hmm. But those store closings can be positive for franchising, says Tony Foley, a longtime franchise executive who now runs Accurate Franchising in Palm Beach, an affiliate of United Franchise Group, parent of Sinorama and other business service concepts. When a new franchise fails, it's probably because they went into business undercapitalized. Rent takes up a large portion of their fixed expenses, and with today's economic reality, we we're able to secure some outstanding lease terms and fees. I mentioned that before. It's a great time to be leasing space. This would not be possible just a few short months ago. One of the most crowded booths at the expo belonged to Tropical Smoothie Cafe, a Destin, Florida-based franchise with about 275 restaurants that sell smoothies, soups, sandwiches, and wraps in 33 states. Here we go with talking about food right before lunch. Yeah, no, I know. Here I was getting hungry again. <laughs> well, and I, I suspect they're probably giving out samples, I guess, right, Don, at the... Yeah, you know, usually they usually, do. You know, they're very big like that. Yeah, it's, that's good. While some franchise food exhibitors had cut back for the Expo, Tropical Smoothie Cafe had gone all out, spending over twenty-five grand to fill its booth with restaurant uh, workers and gave away thousands of sandwich wraps. That was smart, samples. wasn't it? Not to cut you off, but if you think about it, if the other guys are, you know, not giving out samples, you know, right. people are hungry. Uh, you know, you, you can, wow, I talk about opportunity. You know, about people going up to their booth. You know, because a lot of times when you do go to the shows, I know when I go, I always go hungry. You yeah, initially you just might go over to the booth, uh, what what they do, and then then you taste yeah. and drink it. Wow, wow, uh, who are these guys? You start looking around at their logos exactly. and everything. Yeah. 
Mike Rotondo, Marketing and Communications Director, says the expense was worth it. I think we'll get five or six new franchisees from the show, and I know we acquired hundreds of new customers for our restaurants. I never quite think about that at the shows when all the people that are attending the shows, not the franchisees or suppliers, but besides just you know, hoping it leads to maybe getting some new entrepreneurs investing in the franchise, but what about all the new business they might get just for their existing mm-hmm. stores from people maybe first time uh, you know, tasting their product? Right. I like like many franchise systems, Tropical Smoothie Cafe works in an area developer model. Investors pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for the right to sell the franchise within a specified territory. The area developers provide support for the franchisees that bring in on uh, in exchange for a share of the initial franchise fee along with continuing royalties. That's something I don't think we've really talked a lot about. We should maybe talk about the area developer. Yeah, it would be a good uh, topic. Yeah. Uh, and I'll just do a little bit more here. Greg Marcotte, Tropical Smoothie Cafe's area developer for Broward and Dade Counties in Florida, says he attracted a couple of new franchisees who were already profiting uh, from the retail slump. Developers of a couple of new shopping centers who want our cafes, he says, are offering to do the entire build-outs, making the empty shell in the retail center ready for business on the restaurants themselves, saving the franchisee 120 to 150000 Wow. So That's how much that retail market turned around, yeah, for leasing That's space. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, before the recession, he says, all that, um, all that new franchisees could hope for was 60 days of free rent when they moved into established centers. Now landlords are offering four to six months free rent plus other concessions. Wow. So that's great. I mean, I think that's, you know, I mean, it does show that, you know, there is some opportunity out there, you know, with uh, all this doom and gloom, like you say, right. you know, so yeah. that's fantastic. So why don't we take a quick break, Don, and we'll be right back with more franchise interviews. Franchise Interviews. For over two years now, Franchise Interviews has been giving you an up-close, behind-the-scenes look at franchising and entrepreneurship. Through our website, FranchiseInterviews.com, where you can hear and read interviews as well as get tips from some of the most successful sources in franchising. And our weekly franchise radio show, where each week you get to hear a new interview with franchisors, franchisees, franchise authors, experts, and attorneys. And our free franchise news newsletter, which is a must-read for anyone looking to buy a franchise. And don't forget to listen to our podcast, Great Quotes in Franchising. For more information, go to FranchiseInterviews.com or call us at 610-905-2919. That's 610-905-2919. Need a business loan? Talk to Diamond Financial Services, the experts in franchise financing nationwide. Whether you're looking to start a franchise, acquire an existing franchise, or expand your territory through opening new locations, Diamond Financial stands by your side start to finish. From pre-qualification to packaging and presenting your application to securing a financial commitment and through the loan closing process, Diamond Financial is there. While you're waiting, thousands of others are making their financial dreams come true. Don't wait any longer. Pre-qualify now by completing a confidential, no-obligation financial analysis. Let's face it, traditional banks just aren't in the business of financing small business. At Diamond Financial, we specialize in securing franchise loans from $100,000 to $3 million and equipment leasing up to $150,000. Let us help you get started. Go to www.franchisefunding.net or call 877-508-2274. That's franchisefunding.net, 877-508-2274. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Franchise Interviews, where we're asking the franchisepreneur who owns one. I'm your host, Marty McDermott, with my co-host, Don Johnson. And if you've ever dreamed of owning your own business, then you've come to the right place. 
Well, as we were saying earlier, Don, we're very excited about this morning's show. We're meeting with Steve Beagleman, and Steve is an expert in the franchising industry with over 20-plus years' experience. And Steve is a frequent guest speaker with the IFA and has written numerous and fantastic articles on franchising and Franchising World magazine. Uh, has been interviewed in national publications, some of our favorite ma- one of our favorite magazines, Franchise Times, uh, Nation's Restaurant News, and was also a uh, quoted expert in a recent book, So You Want to Franchise Your Business. Hey, Steve, good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Marty. Good morning, Don. Hey, Steve, hey, how, how are you? Hey, how's, Steve? how's things going? Uh, things are well. Things are well. That's good. That's good. Steve, we always like to ask our guests where you're calling from this morning. I'm actually in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is a uh, suburb area of Philadelphia, probably about an hour outside of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yeah, very familiar with uh, Bucks County. It's a nice part of Pennsylvania, Don. I don't know if you've ever been there, but uh, yeah. Steve isn't uh, that far from where I am up in Williams Township. I'm actually north of Steve, so uh, yeah, it's a beautiful part of Pennsylvania. Yeah, nice uh, area. Yeah, Steve, can you tell us um, about your background um, in the franchising industry? When Don and I saw your bio, we were a little intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Steve, I want to talk to you a little more at the San Diego show if I knew you did all this in the past. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, you know, I, don't be intimidated. I have been doing this a long time. I, I started at a very young age in, in franchising. I uh, have been doing this over 20 years uh, and started very, very young. Started in the late 80s in the packaging and shipping industry in a family business my parents had started, which really you know, started my education in the franchising business. And then in the uh, early 1990s, I started my own concept uh, called Black Tie Express, which was a food delivery service, and uh, and then springboarded that into selling my company in 1994 to my largest competitor in that same industry and grew that business to about 150 units, actually went on and became their vice president of development called Takeout Taxi out of Northern Virginia, and then after that, moved back to the Philadelphia area from Northern Virginia, uh, and that's how I've ended up in this area where I've been now for, for you know well over 10 years. I uh, worked for a small regional chain called Bassett's Original Turkey, which had operated um, locations in food courts and malls and transportation centers, spent uh, three and a half years there, and then went on to a uh, national chain called Restaurant Systems International out of Staten Island, New York, which had probably about 150 locations around the United States, also in malls, transportation centers, airports. Took them to about 250 locations while I was there, and uh, and then went and spent uh, well over five years with a chain called Rita's Water Ice Franchise Corporation, which sold Italian ice and frozen custard. Uh, Joined that company when they had about 150 locations and left uh, after we had about 350 locations uh, mainly on the East Coast, and uh, about 100 more locations in development. And my role with the company there was I was the vice president of franchising and oversaw franchise sales, real estate, and the construction areas of the business. And then while I was there, took the company through a sale in May of 2005 to a group out of Pittsburgh um, who had been Wendy's franchisees and stayed on for about six months during a transition and then moved on to a company regionally called Salad Works which did salads, wraps, soups, panini sandwiches, a uh, great regional chain here in the Philadelphia area. Right. And then while I was there, was recruited by a private equity group who had just acquired from the founders a company called Hollywood Tans, which had 250 or so tanning salons across the United States. And I was recruited to be their chief franchising officer was there for about seven or eight months and then was actually promoted to the CEO role uh, for the last seven or eight months while I was there uh, and took the company to about 330 locations, again, across the United States. And uh, most recently have just uh, left the organization and am looking at uh, evaluating my next opportunity. That's incredible. Well, I think I'm, I, I, I am pretty intimidated so am I. right now. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, that didn't help me feel any better. No. <laughs> So your family business, when I mean, that's what gave you the experience to start up Black Tie. Was you being in on that family ownership, you know, having a business? I guess that really gave you a lot of experience to start Black Tie because you were pretty young to really start your own, you know, franchise company. Uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe talk about that a little bit. How, uh, you know, how Black Tie came about? Sure, sure. Well, I did start the company at a young age. I started the business at 21. I actually got into franchising probably at about 17 years old, 
And, uh, you know, people always said when I was younger that I looked older, and that was great. Unfortunately, when you get older and you look older, it's not as good. <laughs> but but starting at a young age and franchising at 17 or 18 years old, uh, it helped that I looked older, and it really you know uh, was exciting to be in in a, a field like franchising at such a young age and learning about the franchising business, having come from my family business. But at 21 years old, while I was still in college, I really felt that you know people today had what I call the time famine where the husband worked, the wife worked, they came home at the end of the day, uh, they were too tired to cook, and they couldn't go out to eat because the children had homework, they wanted to spend time with the kids. So what were they really going to do? The only choice they had for delivery was really pizza at the time. And Domino's and Pizza Hut were doing a great job with it, but that was really the only choice. So I had this idea and this concept where if we were able to bring food from great restaurants to people's homes or offices for the same price they'd pay as if they went there, I think that would be a a well-needed service. And started the concept in 1991 actually as a business opportunity with all intentions of franchising the concept. And in 1993, franchised the concept, converted all my licensees to franchisees, and by 1994 grew it to the second largest company uh, in the industry with about 35 locations. A great story. Did you yeah, ever graduate was, college? <laughs> yeah, I graduated college in between that. I graduated wow. college in 1992. Uh, in between that, while while you know working in the business, and uh, it was really an exciting time. And actually, in 1994, sold my company to my largest competitor. Uh, I had about 35 locations. Takeout Taxi, which was based out of Northern Virginia, had about 60 or 70 locations, and sold my company in November of 94 to them. And uh, it really springboarded my career in the franchising industry. I moved down to Northern Virginia and became their vice president of development and a shareholder in the company and, uh, you know, did deals for Takeout Taxi and awarded new franchises, not only across the United States, but actually internationally in uh, Dublin, Ireland, Santiago, Chile, and Lima, Peru, which was very exciting to do, especially at such a young age. It must have been a tough, a real tough decision. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it certainly was. You mean to sell the company, Don? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it, it certainly was, but I realized at, at 24 years old that, that certainly I knew a lot, but I would know a lot more when I was 34 and 44 and 54 as I got more of an education in business, and I really felt that the time had come where I took the company as far as I could at, at 24 years old. So I really felt that it made a lot more sense to join forces with my with my competitor than to continue to fight them. I was very strong in the with a presence in the Northeast, up in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, and they were very strong down south and out west. So really, we didn't have many areas where we overlapped. It just made a lot of sense, and the timing was right. And I really hit it off really well with the CEO of the company, and we were able to work something out where where the transaction made sense for both of us. And then look at the experience you got having a little. Uh, you know, dealing with a company a little more established, I guess, selling to a larger competitor, and then, yeah, you know, and then obviously being at Rita's, who we've had on this show, uh, you know, there for a lot of their growth for about five years, that must have been really good experience as well, being at Rita's. Yeah, Rita's was a great company, uh, originally founded uh, by Bob Tumalo and his brother John Tumalo joined the company right after. They just built an incredible brand, uh, great brand recognition out here in the Northeast. And when I joined the company, probably about 150 locations were open and operating in, in mid-2000. And probably the, you know, the best five-plus years of my career, most exciting time, great growth, great brand presence. Uh, franchisees did very, very well. We had strong franchisees, strong, strong unit economics, which is very important in any system, as you know. Most of our franchisees became multi-unit franchisees where they'd purchase two and three stores, but almost all of them started with one. We were very careful and cautious to make sure that franchisees were successful first before right. we'd allow them to open store number two or store number three. And, you know, for us it was all about having the right location with the right franchisee, the right trade dress, the right signage. It's kind of like the Golden Arches with McDonald's. Right. The way Rita's was originally successful was that red and white striped awning as you knew it was a Rita's. Right. And, you know, we would not do a site in the past without getting that trade dress. Also, walk-up window service was what made the business so unique, along with just an outstanding product. You know, a great product, a simple business model, and great, strong franchisees. 
and obviously a tremendous team that we had based at our, our home office really built the company to, as I said, well over 350 locations by 2005 and 100 more in development. And it really was an exciting time in my career and, and really enjoyed it and great people and, and obviously the great founders of the business. Yeah, we're impressed with the company. I was at the home office uh, last year, year and a half. I don't know if they moved since you were there, but, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it was like a cult following, too, uh, Steve, with that product, too, I noticed, you know, with a lot of their customers, you know. It, it's like, I know in this part of Pennsylvania, you know, I mean, Rita's is huge, you know. I mean, everybody knows them, and everyone frequents them, you know, especially, you know, in the summertime, at least once or twice a week. Marty, you're absolutely right, and, and Don as well. There, There is no question that there was a cult-like following for the product and the concept, and, you know, we would see that all the time. Uh, we actually never advertised for franchisees, for franchise sales. People used to say to me all the time, you know, what's your advertising budget for franchising? And I would actually say we don't have one. <laughs> the, the stores sold themselves. Uh, the people that purchased the franchises from the company were all customers, people who loved the product, saw the lines, lines attract lines. Once you get there and, and try the product, you become hooked. And we had a whole marketing campaign one year about getting hooked, and you get hooked on the product. The key is to get you to get in there and try it once. It's an inexpensive product. You know, it is a cult-like following. It's a great thing you could do with the family. So you can go out for an inexpensive treat. You know, a family of four can go there for $12 and and really have a great quality product. So we did have a cult-like following. We had tremendous interest from franchise candidates, you know, 3,000 leads every year without advertising. So it was really great. It was how we continued to expand the brand outside of the Philadelphia market was people who would come to the Philadelphia market to visit family or friends. Their family or friends would take them out on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night or even over the weekend and try the product, and they would say, oh, my gosh, there's nothing like this where I am. You know, I live in Ohio or I live up in Connecticut or I live in, you know, Long Island, New York. And that's kind of how the, pro- the concept grew outside the Philadelphia area. And it really, really was successful and, and still is today. Yeah. Steve, let's talk a little bit. You brought up something interesting, how you really were there during a transition. Existing franchisees, now they want to open their second and third. And, Marty, we just read an article a couple of weeks ago about it's not as easy as people think. They have one location open, and, hey, I know the system. I'll open up the second one. That'll be easy. But it's really just the opposite. It becomes a whole different type of job function for that franchisee. What what you know what uh, was your game plan for those existing franchisees, Steve, as they were opening their second and third? Well, in any system, whether it was Rita's or, or Hollywood Tans or any of the systems that I've been with, going from one to two is probably the most challenging and the most difficult step. Going from you know two to three or even you know four to five is a lot easier than one to two, right. because the challenge in a lot of cases is when you have one location, whether it's a Rita's or any concept. You're in that store, you're working that location, you're in there working you know, shifts a lot of times and working with your staff. And when you get to multiple locations, you need to give up control. And that, that's a challenge for some people. And, and you know, we had some great owners who owned one location and were very, very successful but couldn't make that jump or that adjustment to two or three or four. And then others really understood that it's, it's a different mindset, it's a different model, and now, you know, really what we're doing is managing a business. We're managing the marketing function. We're managing the business to really get to that next level. And if you don't give up control, you'll never get beyond store number one in any concept that you're a part of. Right. So you really need to adjust your franchisee's mindset when they're going to store number two and help them make that transition. And we had programs in place, whether it was at Rita's or Hollywood Tans or any of the companies that I've been with, to really help those franchisees make that adjustment. And most of them were able to make it very successfully. Right. Yeah, very important. So, uh, you know, you've been, you've, you've been with small startup franchise companies. You've been at uh, the larger companies. What are some of the big differences between those two types of scenarios, Steve? Well, Don, smaller companies obviously give a lot of attention to the franchisee. So, you know, every franchisee, you know that franchisee by name, you can get a hold of, you know, the, the owners of the company or the CEO of the franchise system. Uh, pretty much you build very, very strong relationships when you're joining a smaller system. When you're joining a smaller system, you also typically get your choice of, of prime territory, maybe in your backyard where you want to be and open a business. You don't want to have to drive an hour to your, your store every day or your location. Right. So you get, you get the prime territory. You get to know the, 
the you know management team, the owners of the company, and the concept, and really build that strong relationship. The challenge is the brands aren't as well known, so it takes time. And you know, obviously, you need to make a decision when you're a franchise candidate or a potential franchisee looking at concepts. Do you want to join a company that's in the infancy and the growth stage, or do you want to join a more established, you know, national brand that has presence but is going to have limited locations available? You might have to go a much farther distance to get that location, and they have, you know, proven systems in place. So you're going to have to follow that system to a T, and you're going to deal typically with a regional operations manager and training managers in that region. You're not going to get to know the top, top level of management in a large company, whether it's a you know, Dunkin' Donuts or a Dairy Queen or, or Yum! Brands, uh, you're just not going to have that kind of interaction with the top management team. They're just too large of an organization. Again, right. great companies, right. but it all depends what you're looking for as a franchise you know, candidate or potential franchisee. It's a real interesting question, though, huh? Like, you know, that, you know, that's where a franchise consultant come in, speaking to an expert like yourself, to really educate someone for that type of decision. Sure, sure. It, it, is, it is a big decision, and you need to really know yourself to know what you're, you're looking for. If you want an absolute 100% proven concept that's been around, tried and true, then you're going to want to join one of the big, big chains that have been around for 20-plus years that have, right. you know, thousands of units. But if you're more an entrepreneur and you kind of want to feel things out and be a part of the growth strategy of an organization and impact some of the marketing decisions and and decisions right. from an operation standpoint for an organization, then you're going to look towards a smaller company, a smaller company that you can have impact, that you could be on the Franchise Advisory Council, right. that you could really be involved with decisions that the company makes for growing the brand forward. If you have more territory, be in on the early part of the curve for that franchise that maybe has had some success so far, but they're really early in their process. So, yeah, real, real interesting. Mm. Yep. In 2006, you started a concept to educate franchise candidates uh, about franchising. It's called the Franchise Roadshow. Can you share with our listeners why that was started? Sure. You know, in 2006, I uh, was attending uh, one of the franchise update conferences, and I was talking to some of the other franchise executives in the industry. And you know, a lot of companies were all you know struggling with the same thing: how do we how do we generate more uh, potential franchisees? How do we educate more potential franchisees about our concepts and about franchising? And while sitting with some of these executives, I came up with the idea of potentially you know, joining forces uh, and actually putting together a traveling roadshow where we will serve two purposes. One is to educate people on franchising and the benefits of franchising. And the second opportunity is to give franchisors the opportunity to reach candidates looking to buy a potential business in those markets. So there were, there were two reasons for us creating this, this Franchise Roadshow program. And what we, in essence, do is in the beginning of each seminar, we would do a seminar for about an hour and a half. We would go to different markets, Long Island, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Dallas, Texas, et cetera, we'd travel all around the United States, and we would spend the first 15 minutes educating franchise candidates on the benefits of franchising. Why would you want to join a franchise as opposed to opening a business on your own? And really explain to them some of the, the benefits of franchising. And then each brand, each company that, that presents, uh, will get a chance to present for about 10 to 15 minutes about their brand and educate the potential franchisees that are there in the audience about their brand. And at the end of the event, we actually give them an opportunity to walk around the event and talk to different companies that they have an interest in. So each company will be able to set up a little pop-up display in a booth and present their brand and their, their literature about their company. And the, company, the concept originally started with uh, four or five companies. At the time, I was with SolidWorks, so SolidWorks, Nathan's, Carvel, and Fantastic Sam's Hair Salons. And the concept continued to grow, and the, the buzz really grew in the franchising industry, and we had companies like Dunkin' Donuts, uh, Contours Express, Philly Soft Pretzel Factory, uh, Wing Zone, and, uh, and, and several other companies, Gold's Gym, and, and companies continued to show an interest in joining us as we took this concept on the road. So very, very exciting for us as, as we did this, and it really, really worked out well. One of the key things with the Franchise Roadshow program is PR getting local marketing 
about each event in the market prior to the event. And a gentleman by the name of Nick Powells, who's now with No Limit Media Consulting, did a great job for us really promoting each one of these franchise roadshows. When we did uh, New York and Long Island, we had a full-page article in uh, New York Newsday the day of the event, educating people about the opportunity to go in their own business, you know, getting out of potentially corporate America, people who are downsized. Now's the time to open your own business. And here's an event that's going to educate you about franchising and give you an opportunity to hear from four or five or six different franchise concepts. So really a great, great opportunity. Yeah, and a great idea. Yeah, really uh, with, with the key being the, you know, the educating uh, people because they think of franchise um, instant Success, just you know, just pay the franchise fee. But you, you know, you're going over all the pros and cons, and really educating people so they can make a decision. It's a, a you know, very good idea, Steve. Yeah, and it's really you know, franchising isn't for everybody. Some people who want to just do everything on their own and create their own concept. I mean, that's that's not the right candidate for a franchise concept. So, really, educating people on the benefits of franchising is is you know, a very important part of the franchise roadshow concept that we created. Right. So true. Are there any franchise concepts or companies that you find exciting today, Steve? Well, I, I certainly see out in the in the franchise community now things that that um, show a lot of excitement are in the healthcare field, mm. kids, and certainly always food. True. So, so in the health in the health aspect, what I see a lot of right now is the spa concept. So, a concept out of the Tom's River, New Jersey, called Hand and Stone Massage, is a very exciting concept. Uh, spas, facials, you know, people, although, you know, we talk about the recession and what's going on in the world today, people might not be taking those big trips um, that they used to take, but what they are doing is taking care of themselves locally. So the spa concept, I think, is, is exciting. Uh, I, for kids, you know, certainly anything relating to kids, and, you know, a concept that I like a lot out of Ohio is called Portrait Avenue, which is portrait studios. I know my wife takes our two kids every three months for their portraits, their pictures, and it's really, really, you know, anything related to the kids' industry, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, birthday party concepts, things of that nature, everybody is, is still spending money on their children and their kids. And then the third category that you always see is, has lots of excitement, I'm sure Don does from a financing standpoint, and that's food. You know, people always need to eat, they're going to continue to eat, and they're going to continue to want to spend money on, uh, on eating in restaurants. And I see a couple concepts from the snack segment. Uh, a chain out of the Philadelphia area called Philly Soft Pretzel Factory has had a lot of great growth in the past two years, a very exciting concept. Uh, it's, you know, pretzels served very inexpensively, so it fits in today's times and today's economics. And then, you know, as far as concepts that are located in malls and transportation centers, I see a lot of growth in the transportation center category, you know, airports um, and train stations are still very, very busy. Uh, a pizza concept called Villa Pizza out of uh, Morristown, New Jersey, is, uh, is an exciting concept that's been around a long time, really stable with about three, 400 locations. So those are some of the concepts that I see that are pretty exciting today. There certainly are so many other great concepts out there. And, again, a candidate or a potential franchisee just needs to understand what are they looking for. Are they looking for an established company? Uh, that's built out, that has hundreds or thousands of units, or are they looking for something that's more startup that they can get in on the ground floor? And that's when they'll make the decision what's best for them. I think it's interesting your answer to that, uh, Steve. You're right. And, and, you know, I know Hand and Stone and Villa Pizza, a couple of, mm -hmm. uh, actually Villa Enterprises, they have several different concepts. But yep, they do. You know, the, kids, uh, the kids' franchises are interesting. My mm -hmm. twins will be five soon. We actually set up their birthday party at a franchise called Bounce You. They mm -hmm. would pump it up. Those are popular uh, type franchises that have all the inflatables and everything, and uh, we, you know, on the food we see kind of a growth in the fast casual. Some of these hamburger franchises, believe it or not, uh, calling the, putting themselves in the fast casual. And you know, Marty and I have been talking about just um, you know senior type services, senior mm -hmm. care, and a few others have seen a lot of growth. Yeah, the senior care, there's no question, has as well. Um, you know, certainly has growth. And you're right, with the kids, uh, the bounce arounds and, and all right. of those types of places, I, I think we have a birthday party scheduled for my four-year-old as well. So, right. you know, it, you're always going to spend money on your family. You might give up those extra vacations right now with, with sure. times being a little more challenging than they have in the past. But you know what? You know, franchising normally excels in, in an economy like this. 
And, you know, once we get through some of these times that we're going to in the next, you know, six months or so, I think you're going to see a real big growth in franchising and franchise concepts. And, you know, people are going to want to invest their money. They want to invest in themselves. They want to do something that they believe in. And you'll see a, a big growth, I think, in the food category and kids uh, and some of these other areas that we talked about. Uh, what are some – I mean, you've been in franchising 20 years. What are some of the biggest changes you've noticed in your career, Steve? Well, what I've noticed is today a lot more people are doing a lot more due diligence. So, you know, 10 and and 15 and even 20 years ago in franchising, you know, pretty much they'd look into a concept and say, yeah, that's what I want to do and and move forward through the franchise process. But today you see a lot more – uh, people want to see a lot more transparency as far as their franchise company. So they want to see actual numbers, which you know a lot of franchisors can disclose in what's called an earnings claim in item 19 of their FDD documents. Uh, they want to actually see the operations. So let me go see a, a location. Let me you know watch what's going on. If it's a retail location, if it's a food operation, let me watch the operation for a little bit. And you know what? You really should understand a business before you get involved in a business. It's really, really important. Know what you're getting into because if you think you like the concept and then you get into it and three months later you're not happy, it's going to be a bad situation for the franchisee and a bad situation for the franchisor too. So you definitely see that people are doing a lot more due diligence than they have in the past, which I think is a good thing because you want to award franchises to the right franchisees in your system anyway. True. You, yeah. Do you think more due diligence, Steve, is because there's just a lot more franchise choices out there, maybe a little more confusion, they want to be a little more careful? That, that might be part of the question, right? Uh, you know, certainly th- that, that could be. Um, there's no question about it. There are so many more choices today than there were, and franchising is a different, a different model than it was, you know, 15 and 20 years ago. The Internet didn't exist 15 or 20 years ago. And, you know, so, so really when you were interested in the franchise concept, you would go to a franchise trade show, which they had literally every weekend. Um, we were exhibiting at franchise trade shows every weekend in a different place, and you'd come away with, you know, a couple hundred potential franchisees, and two or three people would buy, and, and that's how you grew your concept. Today with the Internet, you could do so much research on the Internet and find out about so many different concepts. So And then, obviously, do so much research on the Internet about the concepts that you decide you have an interest in, even before you go and talk to the company. So you see a lot more you know, research than you did in, in, in years past. Um, there are a lot more choices, so maybe people want to make sure they make the right choice. But, you know, as I said, I think that's a good thing. I really do. More multi-unit ownership, more international stuff True. going on. The uh, last yeah. 10 years, uh, some other big things I feel uh, going on. Yeah, Are you absolutely. surprised, Steve, at, at the amount of concepts there are today? I mean, did you know, like, you know, 15, 20 years ago that it would get to this point? I think, like, there's over, like, 3,000 different concepts, you know, and Don and I always wonder how far it's actually going to go, how many concepts are there going to be in another five years, you know, and how many industries are going to be jumping into franchising. Did it surprise you? Yeah, it does a little bit. I mean, certainly, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, we, we, we didn't imagine that franchising was going to be what it is today and how large an organization it is today. I mean, you hear about concepts that start, you know, with with uh, one location and in four years have, you know, five, 600 stores. I mean, just mm. amazing, amazing stories. And, you know, I'm very involved with the International Franchise Association, speaking at a lot of their events. And I just spoke at the Franchise Expo South down in uh, – Florida in January, and, you know, really the, the amount of concepts and new concepts that come out and, and really grow um, is, is tremendous and really, really exciting for the industry in general. So certainly it is a little bit of a surprise from, from a long time ago, but uh, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I think it's, it's what creates a great country that we all live in, uh, creates opportunity. And, you know, the key to franchising is franchising is a relationship business. So, you know, if you take care of your franchisees and your franchisees make money and you have great people behind your organization who really are passionate and care about your company and about your concept and about your franchisees, uh, you know, then, then you're going to be successful. Then you're going to be successful. So true. Yeah, what advice, Steve, would you give to our uh, listeners looking to buy a franchise? Certainly do your research. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is if you don't know what you're getting into. And, you know, if, if you decided you were looking into Aritas, you certainly want to go to, you know, multiple locations, talk to multiple franchisees, understand the business model, understand what the company's like, the company's support, 
and really know what you're getting into. So really do your research, talk to the professionals, you know, franchise attorneys, uh, financing companies like Don's company, and really understand what you're getting into. Because the worst thing that can happen, as I said before, is you get involved in something that you really didn't know what you were getting involved in. And then it's just a bad situation for everybody. Yeah, good great advice. advice. Yeah. Yeah. And how can our listeners get more information on your services, Steve? Is there a number that they can call? Um, sure. Well, they can, they, can certainly, they can certainly email me at sbeagleman at aol.com, and that's sbeagleman, B-E-A-G-E-L-M-A-N, at aol.com, or they can contact me at 267-767-8130. That's fantastic. I want to thank you again, Steve. You've been an incredible guest, and Don and I, I think both agree, would definitely love to have you back in the near future. Yeah, you'll be on, Steve. Are you going down to D.C.? Uh, uh, yep, I will be there, and I will definitely see you there. Good. Excellent. Great. We'll take a picture with you, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Hey, guys, thank you very much. I enjoyed it as well. Same here. Thanks a lot, Steve. All right, take care. Yeah. Yes. I mean, just very, very knowledgeable. I mean, that's definitely one of my favorite shows. I, we didn't even get to ask him everything we wanted to. Oh, we could have easily spoken for another. We, we could have had the show another hour easily. I, I really enjoyed it. So. He had so much experience. Uh, I sure know did. so much. You know, so we'll have to have Steve Diggleman part two. You know, so yeah. Uh, yeah. But again, great job, Don. And again, next week we have another interesting show. We'll be meeting with Dr. Scott Shane uh, on his most recent book, Fool Gold: The Truth Behind Angel Investing in America. And for our listeners, go to FranchiseInterviews.com, go Franchise.com, FranchiseFunding.net. Uh, you can email us at admin at FranchiseInterviews.com. And I think I pretty much said it all right, Don. That's it, Marty. Great job. All Have right. a good day. <laughs> Great job, and I'll, Don. I'll be talking to you next week. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.